I don't care one bit about the Royals. They play no role in my life whatsoever. And I find that I don't really enjoy reading about their lives. Welcome to Keep It Fictional, a weekly podcast for book lovers by book lovers. Build your to be read list with Sadie, Liz, Virginia, Fiona, and Corrine from the Port Moody Public Library. Warning. This podcast contains strong opinions and may cause an increase in your library holds list. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Keep It Fictional, a podcast by the Port Moody Public Library's book lovers for you, our fellow book lovers. Now, today we have a bit of a different topic for you, me and my book friends, and it's a topic that can be somewhat contentious. So most often, if the word monarchy comes up or royalty, that can be quite divisive. And more often than not, thinking of royalty and monarchies, at least in the Western world, we may think about Queen Elizabeth and her family in Great Britain. However, were you aware that there are monarchies and histories of royal families literally throughout most of the world? Everywhere from Africa and Asia to Europe, the Middle East, and even Oceania, if we're counting Tonga. And it's not just kings and queens, princes and princesses, dukes and duchesses, but also emperors and empresses, czars and serenas, sultans and sultanas, and even maharajas. Just to name a few of the many, many glorious titles that can be bestowed upon a person either by birthright or by birth Well, regardless of what you think of monarchies, it's hard to dispute that the very concept of monarchies and royal families can provide so much fodder for gossip as well as fiction. Although some may argue that gossip is also fiction. There are so many literary works of fiction that not only touch on the lives of figures from history that we may already be familiar with and speculate about what their lives were like, But also there are many created royal families and monarchies as we delve into the lives of the rich and famous that also happen to have royal titles. I'd like to bring in my book friends. Hello, Fiona and Sadie and Virginia and Corrine. Well, without further ado, let's get started and see what variety of books we have for everybody today. Um, And today, why don't we start at the other end of the alphabet, and we'll go with Virginia. What do you have for us today? Sure. I didn't find this particularly difficult because, of course, there are so many, like you mentioned earlier, Liz, fictional royalty families that are worth talking about. The first thing I think about when I think about royalty is the court intrigue, the political maneuverings, the treason, the backstabbing, the kingslaying, and all of that good stuff, which made for excellent epic fantasy. And that is what I love the most about epic fantasy. I know I'm probably supposed to say magic or dragons or whatever, but no, it's all about those political intrigue. That is the best thing. So I decided to take this opportunity to read a book that has been sitting on my bookshelf for quite a while. I bought it a few years ago after binge reading all the Game of Thrones and I was looking for something similar. And you know how when you're looking for reader likes, very often people would just suggest you like, other fantasy that has nothing like Game of Thrones. So it's looking for that scale, that giant cast of characters, you know, and and all the ones that you love to love and you love to hate. That's kind of what I was looking for. So when I read this first book, at least in the series, I was like, huh, yeah, yeah, I can I can totally see why this is a good reader like for people who love A Song of Ice and Fire. So the one that I have for you today is the first book in the War with the Mind series, and it is called Acacia, and it is by David Anthony Durham. I just found out that he also has a new kids book coming out soon, so um, that's exciting. Looking forward to reading that. This is indeed an epic fantasy. It is a giant, giant doorstopper, and it is, of course, what I love. But 
giant doll stoppers doesn't necessarily mean that it takes long to read because it it just goes by so fast because his writing is so natural it just flows and you just can't wait to find out what's going on so this is a story of the uh, current dynasty they have ruled in what they call the known world for almost 22 generations and so in this kind of island nation that they have this known world they basically like have conquered everybody. Either it is by force or by other groups that just decided that it is a smart move to go under their protection. And right now on the throne is King Leoden. He is a loving father of four children. His wife has passed away and so he tries his best to spend as much time as he can with the kids, even though he is, of course, a busy, busy man. Everything's going quite well in the empire. It's all kind of a well-run oiled machine. But King Leo then has some sleepless nights because he knows the secrets. He knows the ugly truths that this empire is built on. Many, many, many generations ago, his ancestors has decided to make an agreement with these people that live beyond the known world in what they call the other lands. And they are the Lofen Akalan people. And they are this very powerful group. And the only thing that goes between the two nations is the leak. That really basically has a monopoly of the sea. They are the ones who control everything that comes in and out of this empire. And they are the only ones that are in contact with this mysterious group of people that many people don't even know about or don't know a lot about. But their ancestors way, way, way back has made an agreement with them. Every year, the Akaran Empire is going to send them children children from all over the empire that they just basically kidnapped. And in exchange for the children, and they have no idea what they need the children for, and they don't really want to know either. In exchange, they get what they call the mist, which is this addictive, super addictive drug, which basically keeps everyone in the empire in line, which basically makes sure that everybody will do what the empire wants them to do. And that is how the empire is built. And knowing that King Leoden, he's disgusted at the whole idea, but yet as a king, he doesn't really know how to change that. Now, this secret is not known to many, only to the very closest people to the king. Even the kids, the four princes and princesses have no idea that this is happening. They're completely oblivious to this dirty secret and they only know that they have, they just think that they have the right to rule. But that is going to change because the people of the mine are coming and they have decided to send an assassin to visit King Leoden and his palace. And with that, the four children, the four Akarian heirs, would have to figure out to not just reckon with the truth, but also to figure out who they want to be. What kind of human being do they want to become? And they will be forced to grow up as quickly as they can in order to survive. Like A Song of Ice and Fire, I think this book is filled with characters that are so complex you don't really know who to root for because they're all fairly morally gray and they're like especially knowing the history of the current empire even though the book is clearly centered on them but you're like should i should i like you do i want you to win so it's very very much that like i don't know who i should like in this sense you know you kind of like all of them because they have qualities especially watching their transformation as they are forced to grow up in a very different world and all four of them turn into this very distinct people that are completely different from one another, the way they were brought up. It's just like, I don't know who to like. But one thing you should know is that just like the Stark sister, you should not mess with the sisters. Very important. Do not mess with the sisters. And it's just so interesting to watch all the alliances and how they change. And then, of course, you know, like you find yourself yelling at the book a lot because 
oh, so often they're doing these things. You're like, stop, don't do that. What are you doing? I at least yell a lot when I was reading this book. But just like George R. R. Martin, David Anthony Durham, let's just say, is not afraid of uh, doing what he needs to do to advance the plot or to create this epic story. So be prepared for many, many shocking scenes. I, I keep flipping back to the book because I'm like, wait, did that just happen? No, that can't be. And so like, I have to like reread the last couple of pages. Like, no, no, that did actually happen because he does that a lot. So just be prepared for that um, for a epic, truly epic story. So um, again, this is the first book in a trilogy. Looking forward to reading the next two. So this is Acacia by David Anthony Durham, the book one of the war with the mains. Thank you, Virginia. That sounds thrilling, minus the yelling part, but... High praise to compare it to Song of Ice and Fire. That's when you know it's good because you want to yell at them so much, you know? It evokes emotions, I guess. So, okay, that is a good thing. (laughs) Great. Thank you. Now, Sadie, what do you have for us today for royal families? All right. So I took a similar tactic to Virginia. Um, I do have a few books in my red list that does involve real royalty, actual royalty, but, and this is a spoiler potentially for later on in the episode, I don't care one bit about the royals. They play no role in my life whatsoever. And I find that I don't really enjoy reading about their lives. So I went with a fictional monarchy and that was in Astrid Schultz for Dead Queens. Now, with the title, you might uh, think that the ending of this book has already been given away. There are four queens, and according to the title, they are all going to die. But there is so much more to this book than just that. Uh, So our story takes place in the world in the kingdom of Quadera, and Quadera is broken up into four different quadrants or provinces. And each of these different quadrants, they're They're known for different values and they they all kind of stay very, very true to their different values and their different kind of ways of life. There's Toria, which values commerce and curiosity and exploration. That's where the capital city is. There is Archia, which is a lot about agriculture. They refuse to have technology of any kind or electricity in their lives. Um, Everything that they do comes right from the land. There is Ludia, which is the quadrant of arts and entertainment and creativity. And then there's Ionia. And Ionia is a quadrant of technology. And they value logic over any creative outlet. And they work to make technological advances and superhuman technologically perfect humans as well. And so the four queens in question is one queen from each of the four quadrants. And together, these four queens rule over this kingdom of Quadera. And this is something that occurred many, many years ago after the king of the of the kingdom passed away. And his four wives decided that since there were no heirs, they were just going to take on the ruling of the kingdom. And so going forward in this kingdom's history, it has always been four queens, one from each quadrant who has ruled this land. So that is part of our story. Part of our story lies with the queens, but the other part lies with a 17-year-old thief named Kara. And Kara is a very accomplished thief and pickpocket. She lives in the capital city and her and her friend slash boss, uh, you could say, the, the kind of criminal mastermind, work very hard in the city, pickpocketing and thieving and making a lot of money doing it. So one day, Kara has been tasked by Makiel, her boss, to steal a comms device. Now, comms devices are something that has been created in the technological quadrant, and they hold memories. So someone can download a memory onto this device, and that memory can be used for communication. So it can be transported across the kingdom, and someone else can look at that memory as a sort of message. Um, It can be used for remembrance. There are lots of different ways that it can be used. So Kara doesn't know anything about this device, but she has been tasked with stealing it from a uh, delivery. And so she goes in, she successfully steals this comms device, 
But when she does, the person that she steals it from, a um, comms delivery person, Varen, sees her and almost catches her. Now, she does get away, but not before Varen knows what she looks like and follows her back to her home, follows her back to where she is going to put this device on auction. At this auction, Varen kind of corners Kira and explains that he needs to deliver this device. He has been tasked with delivering this device. If he does not deliver this device, then his life is at stake and his world will be over. Feeling a little bit bad for him, Kara decides that she's going to help him take the device back. Now, through this escape from this auction house, through this uh, escape with the device, Kara has no choice but to actually use the device. And what she sees on the device is not at all what either her or Varen could ever have expected. She witnesses the memory of all four of the current queens being murdered. It hasn't happened yet. They are all still alive as far as she knows. So somehow she is viewing a memory that has not occurred. And she decides that it is her job to try and figure out what is happening, try and figure out who the murderer is and stop the murders from happening. Varen is kind of along for the ride in all of this as they sneak into the palace and try to figure out exactly what is happening. Our story goes back and forth between Kara's point of view in the first person and seeing the point of view of each of the four queens as they find out that they are going to be killed and what leads them to their deaths. There is a huge twist in this book that I did not expect. Reading some reviews, some people figured it out, but I I don't know if I was just oblivious to (laughs) that that part of the story. Um, But there is a very big twist involving the murderer, involving the queens. So if you're looking for something that has a bit of a twist, it's a very fast-paced book. Lead characters that are not always likable, but uh, that you do end up rooting for in the end. Um, There's lots going on. It's a very complicated plot. I hope I have done an okay job (laughs) explaining how how it all works. But yeah, if you're looking for something that has royalty in it, but might not be the main focus, then this might be the book for you. It is Four Dead Queens by Astrid Schult. Everybody's nailing it with their picks today. That sounds twisty and a bit dark. And yeah, who doesn't love a good uh, good surprise at the end? Yeah. I feel like it was one of those those moments where you kind of stop and you're like, like what? And you had to read it again. You're like, no, that's what? So if you want a big twist. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you so much, Sadie. Okay, well, I'm going to change gears a little bit and um, share with you the book that I selected for today. Now, I I did grow up in a family where there was interest in the royal family. So I kind of grew up knowing the names of who was who, at least in the British monarchy. My name is Elizabeth, so that's no real coincidence, I think. Um, So my book today (laughs) involves our current queen, Queen Elizabeth, uh, and it is called The Windsor Knot. And it's by an author named S.J. Bennett. And this is listed as the first of a new series called Her Majesty the Queen Investigates. This one's been described as The Crown, like the Netflix series The Crown, uh, crossed with Miss Marple, which after reading this, it kind of is. It kind of is. It is a murder mystery, and I'd say it is borderline cozy but minus the puns and stereotypes. So is it really a cozy at that point? I don't know. You kind of need those things, but, but I felt it was a good gateway mystery book for those who maybe shy away from sort of the more gruesome scenes. So our story opens in Windsor Castle, one of the Queen's palaces, and it's 2016 and in advance of her 90th birthday. So a huge milestone. And of course, there's going to be many celebrations. Now, as they do, there is a grand party at Windsor Castle one evening, uh, including a performance by a fantastic young Russian pianist. Unfortunately, the next morning, in one of the castle bedrooms, this fine young pianist was found dead, strangled, hanging from his wardrobe in the room. Upon first glance, it could have been a suicide. 
It could have been something kinky gone wrong. However, for those who know what they're looking for in terms of knots, it quickly became apparent that this was no accident. So Her Majesty, of course, is advised as to what had happened within her palace grounds that evening, and she is saddened for the young man and also determined to find out what really happened. So not content to leave it in the hands of the authorities, she decides that, well, this happened on my estate, and so I am going to help find justice for this young man. Now, of course, being the queen, there's only so many places that she can roam, only so many places that she can travel without being spotted and, and whatnot. She is indeed a, somewhat of a celebrity. So she enlists the help of one of her staff. Now, her assistant private secretary named Rosie Oshodi is a British Nigerian officer that she had handpicked to be a part of her staff. And in confidence, she tells her what has happened and asks her to make a few inquiries for her. The queen also tells Rosie that she doesn't want her to engage any other assistants, especially not her private secretary who pulls rank on Rosie. So Rosie is very confused by this. Why would, why would the queen pick me, who's a relative newcomer to her staff, to help her with something very serious? Anyways, Rosie goes about her investigations on behalf of the queen, reporting back to her. And all the while, Queen Elizabeth is doing her calculations and positing her theories and trying to solve the murder of this young Russian pianist. Along the way, we learn a bit more about Rosie and her background, and she almost becomes the key player within this story. So it's not so much about the queen. She's not creeping around like Jessica Fletcher, investigating what's happened on her estate. But it's really Rosie who acts as not only her spokesperson, but takes it upon herself to do a thoroughly good job for her employer. This book was witty. It was not contrived. It, it sort of brought a refreshing take to the whole stuffy Windsor household that people might expect. The character of Rosie is a breath of fresh air, just hearing about um, her diverse background within the empire and how she came to be a part of the queen's household was very interesting. And she's definitely a character upon which I think the series can be carried. As Rosie finds out, this might not be the first time the Queen has enlisted somebody's help to solve a murder. Apparently a lot of murders happen on the Queen's estates. And this is going to be a series, so there's probably many more to come. So if you are looking for a lighter mystery once you move past the initial crime and are looking for something a little bit different with familiar characters in real life, and yet also with new characters. You may want to check out The Windsor Knot by S.J. Bennett. I cannot imagine being the queen and having my life fictionalized in that way. It would be so bizarre. <laughs> in books and the crown and movies with other people playing you. Yeah, I don't know about that either. <laughs> All right, Fiona, what do you have for us today? Uh, so I went back a couple decades for when this was published and did decide to go with historical fiction. Um, so the book I chose is called The 20th Wife by Indu Sundarsan. And it is about the Mughal Empire in India in the 17th century. So I thought of it as it's uh, part of it is contemporary with James the first of England's rule uh, and that helped me a little bit to kind of put this in time because I knew nothing about the Mughal Empire and its royal family so that made it really really interesting. I feel like maybe if you're someone who did know a lot about like maybe the book would be like feel sort of ridiculous but as someone who knew absolutely nothing coming into it this was such a great eye-opener to monarchies in different places other than England. And I actually kind of, uh, I started reading The White Queen at the same time and it gave a really good comparison. I found a lot of like similarities in, in themes 
man, the work that goes into getting on the throne and all of the, just the rebellions that need to be pushed down and the family members who are willing to kill their siblings and their parents and to get to the throne. It was, it's a lot. It's a lot. <laughs> so this book, uh, like Sadie's, kind of seems like it gives away a lot um, in the beginning. And, and I feel like I can be a little bit liberal with spoilers because it is history. This uh, book follows Mado Nisa, and she eventually becomes the 20th wife of the emperor. But this is all about before that. But we know it's going to happen. But it is a journey before that happens. It starts out uh, with her father. He is fleeing from Persia. He's a nobleman. And there has been a change in power there. So he has to flee. And he has his wife with him, who is pregnant, and his three young children. They are robbed in their caravan, uh, and they have nothing. Well, they're extremely fortunate to uh, meet an Indian nobleman at a chai stand who agrees to take them to India and introduce them to the emperor. So this is huge because uh, before that he was thinking, you know, are we going to survive to the next day? And suddenly it seems like he might be set. However, the journey is still long and difficult, and he knows he can't ask for anything else from this man. So when his wife gives birth, he convinces her that it's the best thing to just leave her on the street where someone's going to find her, uh, someone who can actually afford to look after her because her mother's milk has all dried up because she's malnourished. So with heavy hearts, they do that. And who finds her on the street but the man who has taken them in? And of course, he knows this baby and he brings him back to the couple uh, and says, oh, I found this beautiful, beautiful baby on the street. Uh, I'm hoping that you can look after because I know you just had a baby. So, you know, I'll, I'll pay for a wet nurse and it'll be your job to bring her up. And she'll be my ward. <laughs> so this very kind of uh, save this, this effort to save face uh, that, that sort of starts this uh, auspicious life for Melanisa, who is supposed to be uh, just a beautiful, charming baby. And the book follows her life growing up and is interspersed with the story of Prince Selim, uh, who is unbearable. <laughs> oh my gosh, I can't stand him. <laughs> what a jerk. Just like the things he does, like he tries to like kill his father. He's always rebelling. He's so pompous and he just wants a throne so badly. And all these horrible things that happen to people all these people dying because he's just can't wait to get on the throne. But of course, Melanisa um, sees him from the distance and just falls deeply in love with him at the age of eight years old. And that love never dies. <laughs> so like, it'll sound like I'm complaining about this book because like, she's like, this is ridiculous. I, I, oh, he's so annoying. I don't want her to love him. But it was just so much fun drama, like it's just like a historical soap, which, you know, sometimes you just need that. And so I really enjoyed that. There's the Zanana, um, which is all of his wives. So this is Prince Salim, who, you know, maybe gets to be emperor, even though he's such a terrible son. And he has the Zanana filled with all of these wives who are constantly clamoring over each other to get his affections. And then there's also the imperial harem uh, of his concubines, and they're all vying for his attention. But of course, the one who really captures his attention is Melanisa. But throughout the book, there is just so many things standing in the way between their love. It was, yeah, it was really interesting. I think the author did a, a really good job navigating this sort of actual history about this woman who does come sort of like a shadow ruler and is kind of you know has kind of stumped historians so even though it was really over the top and like and and had a lot of drama in it 
it's a pretty interesting historical story. How did this woman, you know, who who could have been left on the street as a baby and died, uh, become the 20th wife, the most important wife uh, to the emperor of India and, and just become so important that she ultimately was the one pulling the strings of, of his decisions. So yeah, if you're looking for something soapy uh, with a little bit of a, uh, a romance that just makes you go, oh, don't do it, Melanisa, don't do it. Um, and a lot of oh, unnecessary violence. <laughs> this was, this was a, a lot of fun and I, it kind of convinced me that uh, I think I might like reading about historical royalty. I'm definitely going to finish The White Queen um, and I certainly like that uh, look at the the hoops that women have to to jump through in history and and the constant conniving they need to do really just to survive and of course that's intensified when we're talking about a monarchy. So check out the twentieth wife uh, by Indu Sundarasan. I think it's the first of a trilogy and I was like oh I'm not going to read the rest of them and then I got to the end and I was like no I'm going to read the rest of them <laughs> so. Thank you, Fiona. Great to hear about a, another royal family uh, from history, from a different part of the world uh, that's often overlooked. So thank you for that. And last but not least, we have Corrine and her pick for today. Thank you, Liz. And actually, um, we chose books about the same monarch. Yeah, I know. What a theme. But I mean, Queen Elizabeth, I mean, she's been around for a long time and she means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. So while I have a lot of feelings about the British monarchy as an institution, probably because I worked there for a little while and have a lot of feedback, but I think it's interesting to look at members of the royal family as as people or might what they might represent generationally or narratively. And so I chose, I'm going to say it, it's a perfect novella. It's a perfect novella by Alan Bennett, who is an actor, writer, and playwright. He's probably most famous for The History Boys and for The Madness of King George III. So he has like a, a lot of things to say about the monarchy. And in this particular book, he looks at Queen Elizabeth a little bit more under the surface of what we think about her. She's still a symbol, but he really wants to get to know her as a person and as a woman of a certain age, a woman of a certain generation, a woman as a certain class. He is really looking at her in her historical and cultural milieu. And I think what's the most interesting thing about the monarchy is that you might, at least in England, you might be the most powerful person in the entire country on paper, but officially you are not allowed to have an opinion about anything. You are not allowed to have an idea about anything. And you are supposed to have no thoughts. You are just supposed to act as a symbol. And this book really examines what happens when the queen starts to have ideas. So this is the beautiful little book by Ellen Bennett, The Uncommon Reader. And it starts with QE2. Um, she may control the entire empire, but she cannot control her corgis. Her corgis, the absolute terror of Westminster, escape from her one day and come yapping up to a strange van parked behind the palace that the queen has never seen before. As she kind of wrangles up her dogs, she meets the man who is in charge of the van and they engage in a little socially awkward chat. She discovers that his name is Mr. Hutchins and every Wednesday he parks his roving library, his little bookmobile, behind the palace to serve the members of the staff of Buckingham Palace. And because it would be uncouth to have a chat with this man and not engage his wares after he has been assaulted by her corgis, she decides to borrow a book. Um, she does say she's a pensioner, so she doesn't have to pay for her library card. He allows her to have six books, but she politely just takes one um, from Ivy Compton Burnett because she met her at a party once and she was a little insufferable, but she recognizes the name. And thus kind of starts the queen on this 
magnificent journey through books. Although she has put a sword on many of the shoulders of these particular writers, she's never really engaged with them intellectually. She's never actually read the book. And as she starts with one book, it leads to another book and another book and another book. And books are all about ideas and people and viewpoints. And as the queen starts to read more, her entire outlook on life begins to change sometimes to the shock and horror of the staff and family members that surround her. It really is the first time that the queen has done something for herself. And if you've ever seen The Crown, you know that her early education was somewhat sheltered. And this is all about someone's entire viewpoint being exploded when they are exposed to different ideas and different points of view. And I love one of the little chats that she has with the vice chancellor where she says, books are wonderful, aren't they? At the risk of sounding like a piece of steak, they tenderize one. And I think that just kind of sums up this wonderful, wonderful ode to reading this wonderful love letter to how the right book at the right time can change your life. It is a book about duty and pleasure and and making sure to do things for yourself. It's a beautiful, wonderful book. And if you're looking for something kind of soul soothing, I would absolutely recommend picking up The Uncommon Reader by Alan Bennett. Interesting how, at least amongst the two books that feature Queen Elizabeth II that we've talked about today, uh, they both take sort of a um, complementary or very positive look at this monarch. Mm-hmm. It's it's very gentle, considering the amount of privilege and power that she wields, sometimes poorly. But I think it's also because a lot of people have an affection for the queen because she's been in power for so long and for so many generations. You kind of see her in like a grandmotherly figure who's also on your money and stamps. Yeah, she's kind of everywhere. Uh- <laughs> So regardless of our our personal feelings about monarchies, the British monarchy or otherwise, definitely so many different kind of books um, out there, fictional monarchies, historical fiction, um, full of intrigue and drama and some humor uh, and lightheartedness as well. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining us for yet another episode of Keep It Fictional. We'll be back again next week with another episode and another theme. So we hope that you'll tune in then. Happy reading, everybody. Thank you for listening. If you like our show, please tell a fellow book lover about it. You can find a list of all the books we discussed in our show notes. Join us next week for another fun book chat. Until then, keep it fictional. Thank you.